it was the idea of Fremantle first that brought me here. Uh, I was a suburban boy from Claremont and I married someone from St James and uh, we went overseas after I finished my PhD and had an extraordinary experience living in Delft in, in Holland in that I was overwhelmed by what it was to live in a walkable city where you ran into your friends in the street. That was the overwhelming experience for me that this notion of a suburb was not actually the only way you could live. At the end of that time, and I had a year in California in between, which just confirmed we didn't want to go back to a suburb, we said, well, where is there in Australia, or in Perth, that is like this, that is like a European city? And uh, we said, probably Fremantle, because it was something that was sort of dirty. What it's meant by that is dense and mixed in use. Uh, it's not got the clean use of a suburb. Now at that stage Fremantle was very very depressed so it wasn't hard to find places but we really wanted to find an old place that we could do up. So we went to the Fremantle Society and they had a long list of places that needed loving they said and we went through the list and this was the one that we immediately fell in love with. The house was valued at zero and the block at $10,000 and we bought it for eight because nobody wanted it. It had been empty, abandoned for six months. We were called the trendies when the young people coming back to Fremantle, the trendies, and we would apparently just leave. Well, we didn't actually. The first uh, people we met on the council we were a bit surprised that we were here, but I said, well, you can call yourself a local after 30 years. Well, I'm a local. I was, um, I was an academic and I had all the theories right and I understood peak oil and I understood the importance of sustainable transport and, and uh, sustainable cities, uh, you know, way back in the 70s, but I, uh, I didn't do anything about it and then uh, the Fremantle Society recognised that, that uh, we were losing things in Fremantle in an attempt to try and break out of the economic depression that we were in. So the, the state government had come along and said, all right, we'll start by building you a beautiful new hospital. And their plans for Fremantle Hospital were to build the ugliest building imaginable and they did. Uh, but we realised that it wasn't enough to just run individual campaigns. We actually had to take over the council. 1976 I was elected to the council. That was the first year we had the numbers. Up until that there was only three Fremantle Society members. It was uh, quite significant when we got the majority. It was, I could only say, similar time to Brad's time on the council. Uh, a whole new approach to life and it invigorated the administration of the council enormously and, and the, they welcomed it. So I did learn <clears throat> quite a bit about uh, the politics of getting things done, which essentially is getting the numbers. If you haven't got the numbers, you don't win. It's not enough just to have ideas. But then in 1979, I was electrified. My political career took off because Sir Charles Court closed the Fremantle Railway down. My advice that I was given was pick your issues. Don't take on the ones that you can't win. Um, I didn't take that advice and we won. So that's a very valuable political lesson also. What seems impossible is not impossible if you get a group together and take on the establishment. I think understanding that the political system is entirely able to be uh, taken on, changed 
and that good things can be won, it's something you never get over. It was a very important transition uh, part of the story for Fremantle because during that the 70s period on the council, we, we drew up big ideas about what we wanted in Fremantle and we began the process of delivering them. But most of them were far too big to do. We just didn't have the budget. I remember following the America's Cup with great interest because I knew that if we won it, this would come to Fremantle and we would have a chance to do things that we would have the boost we needed. We uh, basically decided on $400 million worth of private investment and $400 million of government investment in, in, in a very short period. And all the ideas about opening up the uh, foreshore and fixing up the infrastructure and getting a, a fund together from John Dawkins, the federal member who was also the treasurer at the time, that enabled the social side of things to be fixed in, in Fremantle, including things like restoring the town hall. The sustainability agenda began. 1987 was the, um, uh, the Brundtland Report, and we then had a philosophy that actually encased hope, and we attracted all these wonderful students like Brad Pettit, who came and joined us and began the journey of sustainability at that point. But those ideas remain quite uh, inspirational for me. And the, the, the one about cities, that you need to reduce the footprint whilst improving the livability, um, just brought it all together in a way that summarised what I was on about. That's become the driving idea behind what we've been doing and, and it is really the fundamental idea behind the journey in Fremantle now to demonstrate to the world that a small town can significantly reduce its footprint while it's becoming a far better place to live. And the only way you can do that is by getting good economic development, green economic development. You cannot do it by stopping economic development. Everything just closes down and you, you're back to where, where you were back in 1974 when we moved into, uh, into this house and the economy was completely smashed and, and uh, there was very, very little you could do. It wasn't as though we had a dream run in the 70s on the council or in the uh, railway issue or in my times as this, heading up the sustainability strategy. Um, so you, you learn to get a bit of a thick skin, but I never got a sense that the people of Fremantle were opposed to my ideas. Um, until the pain, the painful experiences of ING and Northport Quay came along. These are two big projects that were designed to build around the railway station. Next issue, which is the Northport Quay one, a set of islands to be built out of dredging spoil off the, the northern tip of the harbour. It was meant to be a zero carbon development. It was very painful because the majority of my friends left <laughs> and uh, uh, saw that I obviously was being um, paid off by big money and, and that clearly uh, that's the only possible way they could understand why I would support such a stupid idea. Very hard to see that happening in your own community and uh, it remains a, a sore point because um, the vast majority of people didn't want to talk about it. They just didn't want to look at you anymore. You know, I, I got sick. I had my brain operation in uh, 2009 
which uh, at that point uh, it was clear that stress uh, brought on my hematoma, uh, it caused it to continue to bleed um, and that that uh, was part of it and what I located most in my life was the stress generated from being in the local newspaper and generating a, a persona that was corrupt. <laughs> the pro-development Green Council that we now have in many ways needed that negativity, the anti-forces of ING and NPQ uh, to jump off and say, well, yeah, we do want to be green, but we also want to get good development and they want to help define it themselves. Fremantle was always uh, my life and soul and the, the work that I did for Murdoch uh, always had a Fremantle tinge to it. And I find it very exciting now to see 60 PhD students and a thriving centre. It's a terrific community, people really committed to each other, a lot of energy and I think that uh, it's now part of the story of Fremantle. It's also a part of Curtin University in a way that um, uh, we would never have been able to do from a suburban campus. So part of your story is to show why that's important, that being part of a city is where you bring about the innovation, the creativity, the change agents that enable the really important um, policies to be developed. It's a story that uh, is really worth telling because it's, uh, um, it can translate, perhaps with not so much colour.